Good evening. Nice to be Washington. Just coming uh, directly from uh, Arizona. It's a big change. So this is my third camp meeting this year, and uh, then I can have a break. My name is Grant Agajanian, and again, I will remind those who have uh, had me in their churches, uh, if uh, you cannot pronounce my last name, I also go by Johnson. So, <clears throat> tonight's message probably will reinforce what Pastor Harold was saying uh, from a different angle, and I hope it's going to be a blessing to you. Brothers and sisters, I do believe that the greater things and uh, hastening of the coming of the Lord can be done only by the power of God. And what is the power of God? According to the First Corinthians and a number of other places, it is the gospel. The power of God is the gospel. So, <clears throat> open with me your Bibles, please, to the First Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, verse 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And uh, the gospel and the cross is having the equality. Both are equal to the power of God. And uh, <clears throat> today, I could state boldly that we are going to experience the power of God. Wow. And uh, <clears throat> it's not because I have a guest speaker, but because of the cross of Jesus will be lifted up. For that, we need to come to understand the cross of Christ from the Jewish perspective. It's only then we can understand... <clears throat> And appreciate the infinite love of God, unconditional love of God, of which Apostle Paul made a statement in Romans chapter 5 that while we were still helpless, ungodly, while we were still sinners, even the enemies of God, God had reconciled us to himself through the death of his son. So <clears throat> have you ever wondered why the cross made such a tremendous impact on the disciples and early Christians? The disciples spent three and a half years with Christ. They traveled with him. They heard him preach. They were taught by Christ. They witnessed his miracles. Yet at the end of three and a half years, they were still a group of greedy and self-seeking men. But then came the cross and it totally transformed them. Now they were willing to be spent and to die for Jesus. Why? Look at the early church. The Bible tells me that they have turned the world upside down. It is because what the cross meant to them. No wonder Apostle Paul making statements that I want the glory in nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified and I want to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, what is it that made the cross the central theme and the central subject of the New Testament preaching? I believe that if we find the answer to this question, the church will never be the same. But the problem is the devil knows that too. And he has done his best to enshroud the truth of the cross in darkness. Because he knows where the power of God is. He knows what will advance the kingdom of God. Tonight, we're going to unveil the power of God. The truth of the cross. Amen? In Philippians chapter 2 verse 8, Apostle Paul made a statement that... Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, and then he emphasizing even the death of the cross. Why are those emphases? You see, <clears throat> the problem of most Christians is that they look at the cross from a very narrow point of view. We know that Romans did the act of crucifixion, but somehow we forget that they were fulfilling the desire of the Jewish leadership. And for the Jewish mind, the cross had totally different meaning. Crucifixion was not a Jewish method of execution. The custom was to stone, right? Why, the, why then they're asking Pilate to crucify Jesus? Let's take a look at the cross from Jewish point of view, not Roman point of view. Crucifixion was introduced by Phoenicians over 600 years before Christ, later on adopted by Romans as the highest form of punishment for worse criminals, runaway slaves, rebels, 
The Jews hated crucifixion, yet in this case they are shouting in one accord, crucify him, and Jesus submitted to it, even to the death of the cross. So what did Jews have in mind when they shouted, crucify him? I will let the word of God answer this question. In uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 32, Apostle Paul making a statement that God did not spare his son. What is it that he did not spare his son from? From death. But which death? Was it first death? Of which I... <clears throat> Jesus himself said it is asleep. Lazarus died. He said Lazarus is sleeping. Or Apostle Paul in this verse refers to a second eternal death. Open your Bibles now to the Gospel of John chapter 19. John chapter 19 <clears throat> and uh, verse 7. We have Jesus healed at the Pilate's court. Pilate questioned Jesus, did not find in him anything deserving death. He actually acquitted Jesus twice. Yet in verse 7, the Jews answered him saying, we have a law and according to law he ought to die. What law are they referring here to? The same verse answered this question because he made himself the son of God. Did they have a law that condemns the one who makes himself equal to God? Did they? Yes. That was the law of blasphemy. God gave this law in Leviticus 24, 16. Let's take a look at this. See how many of you can follow the Bible. Leviticus 24, 16. Leviticus 24, 16. See if you're just listening to the preacher or you're following the scripture. It says, And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly crucify him. A few people following the scriptures. But for the rest of you, I have something to say. Don't believe what I say from here. Don't believe me. Check me with the scripture. Check every person with the word of God. Let's try it again. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall, shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him. The stranger as well as him who is born in the land, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. So this law not only saying that the person had to die, but also how he had to die, to be stoned. So the Jews are telling to Pilate, we have a law, and according to law he ought to die. Did they know how a person had to die or they forgot about it? Let's uh, check with the Word of God. <clears throat> John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 30 and 31. Jesus is speaking here to the Jews, and he is saying, <clears throat> John 10, verse 30 and 31. I and my Father are one. What happened next? The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Why did they pick up stones? They knew the law and they were executing the law. Why, why then they're asking Pilate to crucify Jesus? Especially since the crucifixion was not a Jewish method of execution. Why? Because there was another law in which they were more interested in. You see, the Jews of Christ's days identified crucifixion with hanging on a tree. Let's bring up the cross. For the Jew to be crucified meant that you have committed an unpardonable sin and you are being punished by a irrevocable curse of God, the equivalent of the second death of New Testament Revelation 20. By crying out, crucify him, the Jews actually were asking God to pour out his curse, his wrath on Jesus Christ that he may experience the eternal death goodbye to life forever. And we must remember that the Jews did not believe in the immortality of the soul. This was a Greek pagan concept that crept into church later, and many Christians still buying into this. So in the law that they're referring here to is found in Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. It reads, If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on a tree. But... <clears throat> You shall surely bury him the day so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance for he who is hanged is accursed of God. So let me give you a comparison between dying by stoning and dying by hanging on a tree. If a person is condemned to die by stoning while he is being stoned and dying, he may turn to God in repentance and have hope for eternal life. But if a person is told that you will be hanged on a tree, that person, <clears throat> that meant 
eternal death. That meant forsaken by the life giver, finished. Let me give you a couple of references. Remember when Joshua brought Israelites into the promised land? Five kings joined their forces, fought against Israel. They knew what happened in Egypt. And 430 years prior, Abraham witnessed to them about their creator. And now when, when God is bringing his children into the promised land, instead of opening the doors of their hearts and their cities to get to know their maker, they joined their forces and fought against Israel. God gave victory to his children. Joshua captured these five kings, brought before Israel, and said, these people are not your enemies. They are the enemies of the Most High God. Therefore, you shall kill them and hang them on a tree. Why? To show that the irrevocable curse of God was upon these people. Let me give you another instance. <clears throat> Remember when uh, the Jews rebelled against Rome? In 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. Romans were crucifying 50 Jews every day. Those who rebelled against Rome, these people were heroes of Israel. Did you know that Jewish historians do not mention in the writings the names of their heroes who were crucified? Why? Because they considered them to be accursed of God. For them, these people like that never existed. Now back to Jesus, when he was in a temple and he said, destroy this temple in three days I will raise it up, the Jews understood him that he meant his own body. At the time of Jesus, the high priest was Caiaphas. Caiaphas belonged to the party of Sadducees. And as you all know, Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. Jesus challenged their belief by raising people from the dead and by raising people from the dead and saying that he will rise in three days. Guess what happened? The Sadducees became the most bitter enemies of Jesus. That's why they were stirring up the crowd to cry out, crucify him. And Jesus submitted to it. So, by condemning Jesus Christ to be crucified, they wanted to be sure that he will never rise again and the memory of him, the memory of him will be forsaken. And that was actually fulfillment of the statement in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 19. Take a look at this that the memory of him will be forsaken. Jeremiah eleven nineteen. 19. <clears throat> it says here, But I was like a, a lamb brought to the slaughter. I did not know, and I did not know that they had devised schemes against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be remembered no more. So, when the Jews were shouting, crucify him, they wanted to be sure. They wanted God to pour out his wrath, his curse on Jesus Christ. Did God do it? I hear different answers. I hear yes and no's. Let me lay a scripture on you. The house divided will not stand. <laughs> That was a tricky question. Whichever way you answer, you are correct. God did not pour his curse on Jesus on the cross because Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But the curse that rightly belongs to you and to me, that curse God allowed to fall on Jesus on the cross in one moment 2,000 years ago, God had lifted us from us. Sin, guilt, shame, judgment, even the second death, and he placed this on Jesus who did not deserve it. And as a result, we have a good news. You want to hear the good news? Here it comes. The second death is no longer in your future. Oh, wow, this is a live audience. Praise God. The second death is no longer in our future, my friends. And as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we must be the happiest people on this planet. So, But uh, how can we know that that curse was lifted up from us? Take a look at Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> Actually, let me give you Genesis chapter 3 about the curse. Remember when God came to the Garden of Eden after the fall of Adam and Eve? And he is speaking to Adam and Eve. Curse is the ground for your sake and will produce What? Thorns and thistles. What was on the head of Jesus? Where's the cross? What was on the head of Jesus on the cross? 
the crown of thorns, the symbol of curse. The curse was pronounced on an entire planet, on you and on me. Jesus came to take upon himself. Let us see another passage. Galatians chapter 3 now. <clears throat> Galatians 3 verse 10. Take a look at this. For as many as are, as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, curses everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That means that every single person present here, every single person outside, every single person on this planet are under the curse. Bad news. Very bad news. But unless we understand how bad the bad news is, we will never fully appreciate how the good the good news is. Huh? You heard the bad news? Now is the good news. You ready for it? Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ became cursed for you and for me. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You see now the meaning of the death of the cross? Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And when Jesus was on the cross, he was heard to cry. To cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know what the father did? According to Isaiah chapter 53 and 57, father looked down at Jesus on the cross and he turned his face away from Jesus and let him die. Why? Why did the father turn his face away from Jesus? I will answer this question for you, but for you to appreciate it deeper, there's one more question that must be answered. I will, I will ask you the second question. You give me the answer, I'll give you the first one. Can we make a deal in Washington? Yes or no? Okay. Remember, I need a biblical answer. When Adam sinned, where were we? Oh, wow. Wow. Those people know their, their Bible. But for the, those of you who were silent, let me give you just a brief, very brief seminary course. You ready for it? You could actually go share with your friends that you, you got a seminary course today. So let's see how many of you can actually graduate from it. And uh, once you understand this, you will begin to grasp the gospel on a deeper level. This is very important. Take a look at this. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Listen to this. Hebrews 7, verse 9 and 10. <clears throat> Even Levi who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. When Abraham met Melchizedek, where was Levi? In his loins, in him, right? And when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, because Levi was in him, the Bible said, Levi did it also. Are you with me? This is the concept of biblical oneness, biblical solidarity. It's actually a very simple concept. Let me give it to you in different form. God created all men in one man. Are you with me? That's the same thing. The devil ruined all men in one man. That's the same thing. Are you with me? Not yet? God redeemed all men in one man, Jesus Christ. That's the same thing. So when Adam sinned, where were we? In Adam. And what happened to Adam happened to whom? All of us. In one man, the devil ruined the whole human race. Bad news. But God had a plan. That plan was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Before God created this world, before sin entered the human race, God had a plan to save us. Hallelujah. And when the fullness of time came, God sent his son in the likeness of human flesh. Jesus Christ became the second Adam. And the Bible tells me that God had put us in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, it is of God that we are in Christ. And Jesus Christ lived sinless life. Now both Adams are under the same law, every aspect of it. That is whatever happened to the first Adam, because we were in him, happened to us. And whatever happened to the second Adam, because God had put us in him, now God considers that it happened to whom? 
Wow. Some of you grasp that. He considers that it happened to us. But he did not stop there. By the way, have you heard actually the statement righteousness by faith? Colossians 2.10, in him you are complete. Not the sinners, in him you are complete. That's what Pastor Harold was actually speaking to you for 35 minutes. In him you are complete. But God did not stop there. Then he took the whole human race in the flesh of Jesus and he brought it to the cross to meet the justice of the law. All mankind was represented in the humanity of Christ that died on the cross. And when Jesus was on the cross, he was heard to cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Father turned his face away from him. What made the Father turn his face from Jesus? Another question is simple one. Whom did the Father see on the cross that made him turn away from Jesus? Make it personal now. Whom did the Father see on the cross? Ah, oh, he saw you in Christ. He saw me in Christ. And the Father turned his face away from Christ and let Jesus Christ taste your second death. That's why the second death is no longer in our future. You are the children of the living God, the almighty God. Why are we walking on this planet as if we are not what God had proclaimed us to be. Why? The Seventh-day Adventist Christians must be the happiest people on the planet Earth. We must be contagious for Jesus. My friends... <clears throat> Jesus not only took your sins to the cross, he went to the cross as you, as me. Jesus not only died on the cross instead of you, he died on the cross as you. With your name and with all your sins, with all that you are, it was nailed to the cross. You're justified. You're declared righteous. You see, Jesus was not a sinner, but he invited the Father, to treat him as if he was a sinner, that we who are sinners might be treated now as if we are righteous. What a generous God we have. What a generous God. So, a tremendous collision took place on the cross of Christ between God and man where all the pain was absorbed by the heart of God. So whatever happened to Jesus, now God considers that it happened to you. And by the way, that includes not only his dying, but also his living. I know you're going to call me now radical. Why would this happen to Jesus? Why? Well, I will tell you why. Because John writes the words of Jesus in chapter 3, verse 16, saying, For God so loved the human race that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever be good should not perish but have eternal life. That's how your Bible reads? <laughs> My Bible says that whosoever believes in him, he made it so easy. That's why the righteousness is by faith. We have none. We cannot produce any. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let me spell out this love for you. How profound this love of God is for each one of us, for every human being. In John 17, 23, Jesus was praying to his Father in the presence of his disciples. Today you are his disciples. And he's saying, Father, that they may know that you love them as you love me. Now I will paraphrase it to bring it home for you so you actually could hear the words of Jesus. Hear what it says. It simply says here that God the Father 
loves you not less than he loves Jesus Christ. Wow, getting colder here. <laughs> Let me repeat this again, just in case if you were shocked. God the Father loves you not less than he loves Jesus Christ. Wow. And in John 15, 9, Jesus is saying, just as much as Father loves me, I love you that much. So here we have it. God the Father loves us infinitely, and God the Son loves us infinitely. Then Jesus went to the cross, and on the cross, he signed with his own blood what he just said. And while being on the cross, he's tempted three times, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross and save yourself. Could he do it? Of course he could. But could he, by coming down from the cross and saving himself, save us also at the same time? No way. He had to make a choice, and the choice that he made should speak loudly to every human heart today. To every human heart. Today it speaks to you. When I first discovered this, it broke me into tears. I could not stop weeping when I understood the cross. And uh, I was a changed man then. I invite you to visit the cross with me tonight. We are 2,000 years ago at the foot of the cross, watching Jesus after he was scourged, the flesh by scourging with the, with the sharp bones at the end of the whip and metals. It was just ripping off his muscles, his flesh. He was bleeding, and he watched him being nailed to the cross then they push the crown of thorns upon his brow and the length of the thorns five inches. And uh, as he's hanging on a cross, you watch from a distance, but you could see him. He is lifting up his head. He is opening his friendly eyes and he looks at you and you know that he wants to speak to you. And as you keep watching, he does something incredible. He begins to lift up his body on nailed hands. Because you cannot speak from the cross. You have to do this. Lifting up your body to take the breath to speak. That's why he spoke only seven times from the cross. And as you're watching him, he is lifting his body on nailed hands. He took his last breath and he spoke his last words to you. Have you ever heard the last words of Jesus from the cross? What would have been his words to you if you would be there? I have heard those words, my friends, and it changed me. And I want to share these words with you today. Don't get me wrong, he never uttered these words, but his action speaks louder than any words. And here's what it speaks to each one of you. Whoever you are, whatever country you're coming from, it doesn't matter to me, he says. Whatever color of skin you have, it does not matter to me. Whatever you have done in the past, it does not matter to me. I can't come down and save myself, but I cannot save me and you at the same time. I choose to stay on the cross because I love you more than I love myself. And he died. That's who God is, my friends. That's who your God is. God who declared you righteous and now you're in the process of him making you into what he declared you to be. And he will do it. The work that has begun in us is faithful to complete it. You need to walk with a joyful heart. Every day. Every day. So my friends, for the joy that was set before him, Hebrews 12, 2 says, he endured the cross and despised the shame. The joy of Jesus was to restore us back to eternity and to righteousness. The cross of Jesus was loss of his existence. So the joy of Jesus to restore us back to eternity and to righteousness was so much greater than the perspective of him losing his existence. So he endured the cross and he despised the shame for you and for me. I know Harold asked you that how many of you were baptized. But I'm going to ask you differently. How many of you were not baptized? How many of you did not give your heart to Christ yet? Let me see your hands. Is there anyone sitting here today that the Holy Spirit is moving you tonight? You finally discovered that you are loved. 
with such a love that nothing can match that love. You had some reservation. You did not know whether you should make that decision or not, but tonight, God had revealed himself to you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, and he is asking you, would you commit your life to me? Would you allow me to bring happiness and joy to you and bring eternity to you? Would you like to have that gift? Anyone sitting here tonight, maybe you're watching us online. Anyone sitting here tonight that you do not, you did not yet give your heart to Christ. And tonight, you are making the decision. I want to see your hand or stand up wherever you are. Anybody? Maybe someone is online watching us. Accidentally, maybe you came up the program and you're watching and you're touched. I'm asking you, Google Washington Conference of Seventh-day Adventist Church and ask anyone to help you to find your local church there and go there and tell them that you've heard the message. And that's why you're here. They will love you. They will embrace you. They will teach you the word of God. They will lead you step by step to Christ. So my friends, God is planning to do greater things through us. The apostles turned the world upside down. Why? Because the power of God was available to them. And that is the gospel. That very gospel is available to us today. That is the power of God that will turn the whole world upside down. It is available to us. Are you willing to take hold of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ? And Jesus said, greater things than I will you do. Jesus lived in human flesh. He did great things, did he? He never sinned. And he said, greater things you will do. How could that be? If the Bible says the disciple is not greater than the master, let me tell you how it can be. Jesus did that in human flesh. He never sinned. We, because the same power is available to us that was available to Jesus, we will do the same thing, but because we have partaken of sin and we'll do the same thing, Jesus is calling us greater things. Through that power of God, my friends, through this conference, greater things are ahead of you. Take hold of the gospel of the power of God and run with it. Let us finish the work. Amen? Let us pray. Loving Father, Thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. For loving us that much that you not, did not spare your only begotten son. You emptied heaven for our sake. Father, our hearts are responding to you tonight. And we recommit ourselves to walk with you, to take hold of the power of God, and to do the great things that you have for us. Father, bless this congregation, bless the conference, the leadership, Lord. And may the power of God, Father, be poured out on this church in Washington that the whole state will be enlightened with the glory of God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, quick thing. I have two minutes, 33 seconds. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I believe I have two assignments here in the morning at 9 o'clock at 10.45 if you want to hear the gospel messages then uh, you're welcome to come. I'll see you there. God bless you all. Thank you.